Welcome back. All right, so apparently it's time to do a video talking about the Calgary Flames. Now, I could have tried to throw this into a news of the day, but it felt like, no, no, this this needs to be its own video because there there's definitely something with Calgary that's off, and I've talked about that this year. Now, one thing I said earlier in the season when they were struggling was Calgary doesn't have a lot of really top-notch star players. They have some very good, hard-working forwards. They have some guys who could put the puck in the net, yes, but in terms of big superstar names... They're kind of short on that. Now, part of it is they bring in Jonathan Huberto from Florida, and he hasn't been as advertised. Now, last night after the loss uh, that they suffered, uh, their, uh, the player agent for Jonathan Huberto, Alan Walsh, tweeted out the following. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Einstein didn't say that. Just throwing out there, it's always said that Einstein said that he never said it. <clears throat> also, Negativity sucks the joy right out of the players, and then he puts CC at NHL Flames, so carbon copy at the NHL Flames, which is the Calgary Flames official Twitter account. Now, I I, I do think that it's it's an oversimplification on some level, and yet at the same time, well, Daryl Sutter's had this issue before. Uh, Sutter's known for having quite the temper, for going off on teams when they're not playing well. The interesting thing is that used to be the way coaching worked. That was quite common. Now it's not. Uh, we see more often than not now if a coach is really angry at his team, it's all over the news. Everybody's like, can you can you believe what he said? You know, yeah, everybody else thinks the team sucks, but the coach isn't allowed to say it. So for Sutter, he's in his third year with the Flames as well, and he didn't last past his third season the last time out. Um, Sutter can be a coach that gets really good results, and he can also be a coach who's you know, a welcome wears thin after a short while. Uh, now, what's interesting is when you look at his all-time record, I don't think this includes this season, but in 1,452 games, 724 wins, 522 regulation losses, 101 ties, 105 overtime losses. He won the Jack Adams last year. So he's been around the league for a long time, and last year, that's the first time he's won the Jack Adams as coach of the year. Kind of a bit of a surprise he didn't win it with the Kings, but the Kings weren't a regular season juggernaut. They were a postseason juggernaut while he was behind the bench. And that's where it's interesting, too, is when they're winning, when a team that Daryl Sutter's coaching is winning, everything's pretty good. But when things turn bad, things can get really, really ugly. And they can get ugly really fast. So when we look at the Jack Adams winners, I wanted to talk about this because it's fascinating. So 2021 is Brenda Moore. He's the coach in Carolina. He's still the coach in Carolina. But he's the exception here. 2020, Bruce Cassidy wins it for Boston. He's no longer there. 2019, it's Barry Trotz with the Islanders. No longer there. 2018, it's Gerard Gallant with Vegas. He's no longer there. 2017, it's Tortorella with Columbus. Nope. 2016, it's Barry Trotz with Washington. Nope. They won a cup with him, and then they parted ways with him. Uh, Bob Hartley in 2015 with Calgary. I'm sure Tortorella congratulated him personally. Uh, Patrick Waugh in 2014 with Colorado. 2013, it's Paul McLean with Ottawa. 2012, it's Ken Hitchcock in St. Louis. And 2011, it's Dan Bilesma with Pittsburgh. Now, how many of those ended ugly? How many of those relationships didn't end well? And how many of those coaches are currently not with the team that they were with when they won that? It's it's ridiculous. So winning coach of the year doesn't give you any kind of uh, any any kind of job security. Not only that, but but even having a contract doesn't give you job security. How many teams are paying for multiple coaches? How many teams are paying for three coaches right now? Just Vancouver, really? All right. Anyways, uh, so reportedly, and this is this is from Sutter's past uh, in 2015 during the final two weeks of the season, uh, Sutter wasn't allowed in the locker room. Um, because after a loss, he would berate the team. And when he got them to, uh, you know, when he went and he found a custodian to, to unlock the door so he could get into his own locker room, uh, they had actually set up uh, waste baskets, so, so garbage cans in front of the door to try to barricade him, and the players had already left when they realized he was going to get in. And I seem to remember, and I was looking this up, uh, that the Kings locked him out of players-only meetings uh, towards the end of his time in L.A., and he had worn out his welcome. So 2017, he was fired when the regular season ended, along with GM Dean Lombardi. And Drew Doughty that summer said, yeah, we need a new coach. And uh, for the LA Kings, they were going into the, the, the rebuild that they're currently out of now. I guess you can call it a retool because it wasn't that long. They were below the playoff line. But it was a tough time, right? 
Uh, he would go to Anaheim, Daryl Sutter, and then he would leave Anaheim to go to Calgary to become their head coach once again. Now, in the spotlight is Jonathan Huberto. Last year in Florida, 80 games played, 30 goals, 85 assists, 115 points, and he's a plus 35. And Alan Walsh was quite vocal about how he deserved the heart. I was never of the belief that he was a Hart Trophy favorite. Um, I will say candidate, top five, sure. Could absolutely see him top five. I didn't see him as the favorite because to me, the best player in Florida was still Sasha Barkov. Now this year in Calgary, uh, 52 games, 10 goals, 26 assists, 36 points, and he's a minus two. Now whether his numbers have fallen off because of the coaching or whether the coaching has had trouble because his numbers have fallen off, the reality is Huberto has not replaced Matthew Kachuk. And Mackenzie weger has been fine on the blue line, but this is a blue line that's also been without Shillington. Uh, this, this is a blue line that also lost Goodbranson. The interesting thing is, I don't think they'd go back inside Goodbranson for what he got from Columbus, but Goodbranson was solid for them on the blue line last year. And they had a really good season. And it kind of feels like with Calgary, they had sort of a, a for different reasons, but something similar to what Vancouver went through. Uh, that they made the playoffs in 2020 and then guys left. And there wasn't really the attempt made to keep things together. And it felt like that was kind of disheartening for the Canucks. And so maybe on some level, the Flames in training camp, realizing that Goudreau and Kachuk were gone, I mean, that that had to be somewhat uh, difficult for them, right? So you say all the right things in training camp, and oh, we're here and we're going to do our best to make up for it. But then you realize that Manjupani has fallen back to a more standard number for his goal totals. Uh, Manjapani's a hard worker. I wouldn't rule out another 30 goal season, but he's not there now. So when we look at Huberto's numbers, that is, that is troubling because he is there to do the work that Kachuk's doing. Kachuk's numbers in Florida are ridiculous. So that makes it look worse too. Now, Johnny Goudreau has not set the world on fire with Columbus. I don't think he regrets signing in Columbus. I won't go that far because I won't speak for him. But it, it can't be a lot of fun for him in Columbus either. Now, the Flames, since the All-Star break, are 1-2-2. Two, and two. So they've only won one game out of the five. They've only lost two of those in regulation. They've got to extra time for two of the losses. But again, they're still losses. It's not going to make Daryl Sutter feel better. He's not going to go into the locker room and go, hey, boys, we got a point. He's going to be in there like, hey, boys, we should have won that in regulation, and here's why, and here's where we should have won it. And that kind of... Coaching, I, I understand why players of today aren't as receptive to it as players might have been in yesteryear. It's not that players enjoyed it back in the 80s and 90s. They just put up with it. They tolerated it. Players now, they'll tune it out, and, and they won't tolerate it quite as much. Uh, and we've seen, too, that you can win championships without coaching that way. In all sports, we've seen really nice coaches who coach well, good players coaches that win championships. So one thing that I think stands out for Calgary is the, the goaltending numbers. Markstrom last year had an 891, or this year has an 891 save percentage. Last year was 922. That is a ridiculous difference right there. That is an insane difference in Markstrom's numbers. Vladar was a 906 last year. He's an 899 this year. Now, I'm not going to throw shade at Vladar because Vladar, uh, up until recently, had gone 13 games with at least a point in each game. And he, he he's had some really, really stellar games. Last night's game, not one of those stellar games. Detroit lit him up, and whether it's Detroit having a book on him, and this is one of those things that we, we talk about on this channel a lot, uh, teams will get, or well, the NHL, the league itself, will get a book on on players and on goaltenders, and it's up to the goaltender to evolve and to get his game going. Now, from last year, Johnny Goudreau, 82 games, 42 goals, 73 assists for 115 points, um, or no, 75, 40 goals, 75 assists, 115 points. I, I, you know, I always have at least one error per board. I shouldn't create an error during the video. Uh, Kachuk, 82 games, 42 goals, 62 assists, 104 points. That's 219 points. That is 82 goals. Huberto has 10. So now you're looking for, and I understand the season's not done yet. That's 82 over a full season. But 10's not cutting it. Jonathan Huberto, though, is not really a, a great goal scorer. Like, he can score you 20 or 30. And he still could have a rally in the last 30 games of the season to end up with 20 goals. But he's not a goal scorer like Kachuk. He's not an agitator like Kachuk. It completely changes Calgary's game without Matthew Kachuk in the lineup. So when we look at their last five games, so for most players, this will be since the All-Star break. For some, they may have missed games with injury. Looking at Rasmus Sanderson, who returned last night, missed games. But in the last five games played by these players, 
Elias Lindholm, a goal and three assists. I think Lindholm's a very good player. Really, really solid. Um, definitely taking a step back. He hasn't had the kind of production from his line mates that he had last year, and so it's hurt his numbers. Toffoli, four goals, two assists, six points. Uh, Tyler Toffoli's playing really well, and I, I feel bad for him that he's in this situation now in Calgary. Um, I mean, he's, he's been through Vancouver, Montreal, Calgary. He may be done with Cal with Canadian teams if things don't work out with Calgary. But he's been arguably their best player. Arguably their best player and their MVP at least over the last five games and maybe for the season, right? Toffoli's been a really good foot soldier for them. Uh, Kadri, a goal and an assist. He got both of those in the same game. So he's had a hard time and his plus minus tells you he's struggling as well. Uh, Nazem Kadri initially when he you know, gets to Calgary and to start the season playing very, very well. Calgary had such a hot start and it's cooled off for Ka for Kadri as was expected. He wasn't expected to produce in Calgary the way he did in Colorado last year. Uh, then you've got Hubert O, three assists, no goals. So coming back to this, Johnny Goudreau, Matthew Kachuk, 82 goals between the two of them last year. Hubert O, three assists. And and so this is where if if you're Alan Walsh, you're going to say, well, he's, he's being misused. He's not happy. Uh, he's on the wrong line. He's And you can come up with a lot of reasons. The reality is that there are a lot of players in the league that may feel like they're not being used properly. They may not be happy with their ice time. They find ways to get that production going. Um, I remember Ovechkin at one point in time in his career was being busted down the lineup, which, as crazy as that sounds, happened. And so he started scoring goals to make sure that he got pushed back up the lineup. Now, Huberto's not Ovechkin, but that's kind of part of the point. Huberto last year had a career year. He had an amazing year. He was not going to replicate that. Even if he was in Florida, I don't think his numbers would be a lot better. He'd probably, I, I would think in 52 games, if he was still in Florida, he would probably have 54 or 55 points, right? I don't think he would have the kind of point totals that Kachuk's put up because I think Kachuk is a better player as well. And that's where the arguments will come up, right? That you'll have a player that might be having a career year. When you really look at the, the big picture, you say, I understand that guy's having a great year, but I would still rather have this player if you're telling me that I'm putting a team together from scratch because I have more faith in this player being able to sustain it. And so Huberto comes to Calgary, signs that eight-year extension, which already looks like it could end up being weight around the Calgary Flames. And not only that, but for Brad Tree Living, if that doesn't work out and if Huberto bombs in Calgary, that's probably his job, you'd have to think. An eight-year contract like that, that could end up being in it for him. Uh, Dylan Dubé has been fantastic for Calgary since the deadline, or since the deadline, since the All-Star break. Four goals, three assists, seven points for him over the last five games. So Dubé and Toffoli are the offense mostly, um, other than Coleman, who has two goals and two assists over the last five games as well. But I would also counter with this. If Toffoli... Uh, Dubé and Coleman are your top three scoring forwards over your last five games. Uh, I understand being one, two, and two. No shade towards those players, but again, where's that big superstar player? Huberto was going to be that guy. That was what you signed him to that big money for, and he's not. And so you're left with a guy like Dubé, who's a hard worker, good shot, absolutely having a great year, uh, to fully having arguably the best season of his career. And again, Coleman, a hard worker, uh, being the guys who are putting up the points and the goals. Backlund, a goal and four assists, five points. I have uh, extolled the virtues of Backlund on this channel recently. I think he's an excellent two-way forward. Probably a bit underrated. I would think if he played in Boston, Toronto, New York, somewhere like that, he'd get a lot more attention. Uh, Mangiapane, a goal and an assist. Just the two points in your last five games. Mangiapane, the work is there. And I, I, I love his work ethic. I talk about it all the time. But the results haven't been, and not the same as last year. And I think last year was a career year. He had a fantastic first half, and it did tail off a bit for him after that. Uh, Coleman, as I said, two goals, two assists for him. And then you got Hannafin, three assists. Noah Hannafin, arguably their best defenseman this season. I say arguably because I'm sure Erasmus Anderson, there's an argument to be made. And Chris Tanev, there's an argument to be made as well. But for Calgary, this is tough because the schedule, the upcoming schedule is not easy. Uh, it's not it's not impossible to see them winning, say, of these six games I've got on the board. I would say three wins are, are quite possible. Two wins are probable, uh, but that's not going to be good enough. Uh, we've seen Cal Colorado getting better. Uh, Nashville's within striking distance, and St. Louis, rumors of their death have been greatly exaggerated. So, yeah, 
Uh, upcoming schedule for Calgary is as follows. Saturday, they're at home against the Rangers, who are currently 32-14-8. Monday, they're at home against Philly, who are 22-24-10. So of those two remaining in this, this homestand, the Rangers are going to be tough. They're playing tonight, though. So with them coming out of Edmonton, second half of back-to-back, maybe they can take advantage of that. Philadelphia, they should win that. Then on Wednesday, they go to Arizona. Arizona's 19-28-8. They should beat Arizona, but again... Tampa Bay should have beaten him too, and Connor Ingram said no. Uh, then they go to Vegas on the Thursday, so that's back to back. Vegas is 33, 18, and 4. And they don't have a goaltender right now that they have a lot of faith in. So while Sutter may take a lot of blame for the way that he talks about the team and rolls his eyes at things, the reality is the numbers just kind of back up what he's saying. And that's when we get into the argument of, well, is it his fault or is it someone else's? Uh, then they go to Colorado on the uh, Saturday, uh, this Colorado 29-19-5 and, and coming on quite fast and getting a little healthier. And then the Tuesday game following that is at home against Boston, who are 41-8-5. And, and so, yeah, I mean, four of the six games they have upcoming are against teams that are above the playoff line. I would say of those teams, the Rangers playing quite well. Boston started to play quite well again. Colorado's playing some really good hockey. And Vegas, Vegas is showing some fight. And so this is going to be tough. Philadelphia uh, is capable of putting up a really strong defensive game. You have to score to beat them. And Calgary's a team that hasn't been scoring enough recently. And so then that leaves Arizona, who again, as I said, uh, got that win over Tampa Bay through Connor Ingram being fantastic. And you can't rule out being goalied by the Arizona Coyotes. And so there's a lot going on here. It's easy to point the finger at Sutter. I'm sure Sutter's reaming these guys out. I am absolutely certain that Sutter is ticked off with things. But the idea that a coach shouldn't be ticked off with things and shouldn't be vocal about it, I find that so weird. I find that so odd. And and it's why every time Sheldon Keefe says anything remotely negative about how his team per, is, is playing, and it's all over the media, I, I don't understand. Is he supposed to say, well, we gave it our best. We'll see what happens next time. Is that supposed to be the soundbite every time? Should Daryl Sutter sit there with a smile on his face and say, guys, I love being a Calgary Flames head coach. This is great. I love this. Oh, tonight's game? I love being the coach of the Flames. This is just awesome. This is fantastic. I couldn't be happier. Couldn't. There's no way to make me happier than I am right now in this moment. What's that? Tonight's game? You know, games are just... Why are we talking about games? Why? Let's talk about practice. Anyways, uh, the Flames are a team that I, I could see finishing outside of the playoffs. And again, I, I've, I've talked a lot lately about how they kept frittering away points. And this is where it costs you. Because uh, now they're really starting to struggle. They've got the two overtime losses here. But boy, if they were 3-2 and two instead of 1-2-2, and two and two, we might be having a different conversation. And maybe Alan Walsh doesn't send that tweet. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as always. What do you think it is with the Flames? Again, when I look at this team, I see a, a, a good team. I don't see a great team. And I don't see that superstar. In a division where almost every team has a superstar. I mean, in Vancouver, everything's a disaster. But Pedersen still, super, still is a superstar. Uh, you've, of course, got McDavid in Edmonton. Um, Seattle's got this great just everybody's, you know, chipping in for everybody else mentality. Uh, McCann's kind of got a superstar quality to him a little bit, but that's just Seattle as a four-line juggernaut. And it feels like what Seattle's doing is what Calgary's supposed to be doing. That Seattle's rolling four lines. They got all six defensemen. They're playing quite well. That's supposed to be Calgary's game, and it hasn't been this year. <clears throat> so how do you get it together? Who do you trade? What do they do at the deadline? Do they sell? Does, does Brad Tree Living go, this team isn't going to do it, and just decide to bite the bullet and have some kind of a soft sell at the deadline with the idea of regrouping for next season? Let me know your thoughts. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.